Well, yes, I am Linda Simmons, and I am from Bedford, New Hampshire, and I stress that for a special reason, which I will explain, and why I am the Duchess of Bedford and the Duchess of Tea. Uh, today I'm going to share about hospitality, the history of tea, and how to prepare a proper tea. And I hope that by the time we're done, you will not be afraid to enjoy making a nice, quick, loose leaf tea. I have a lot of information, I do have my notes, and I don't want to forget anything, but sometimes my brain will scramble and I'll go off on whatever tangent I'm on at that moment, but I, this helps to bring me back to everything that you need to know. Well, Anna Marie Stanhope was the seventh Duchess of Bedfordshire, England. And in England, they would have an enormous breakfast, a light lunch, and a very large dinner. But around 4 o'clock, she would begin to feel a wee bit hungry, the Duchess. And she asked for some little cakes to be served with her afternoon cuppa. Soon she started asking others to join her, and the custom of afternoon tea began. Uh, I also do afternoon teas, and so I like to say that she lived on one side of the pond, and I live on the other, and now I am the first Duchess of Bedford, USA. And we both extend the gift of hospitality to friends. Hospitality is the gift that says welcome, and it's setting aside special time just to be with each other and just enjoy each other and stop with the hustle bustle of our regular lives especially maybe with the holidays coming, you might want to take tea time. So afternoon tea has many dainty delights, and everything is served in small bites. I like to say it's all two bite, and that should be it. Your little sandwich or your scone, everything's miniature. And the sandwiches, uh, you have a few different varieties. When I, this is my menu. When I prepare a tea, I like to serve always cucumber sandwiches, and I have my own recipe for a uh, mock boursong, so, and that's my spread that I put on. And I'll do a chicken salad or an egg salad and also a hot uh, crab sandwich. So those are the few of the different things. And then, of course, the scones are always wonderful with some lemon curd or a Devonshire cream. And then treat time is uh, you could have lemon squares or almond squares. And with tea, you like to always have something chocolate. So one of your little sweet treats could be chocolate. Or if you were worried about the calories, which oh, who cares with all this, <laughs> you could have strawberries dipped in chocolate and enjoy it that way. So uh, afternoon tea has sometimes been called high tea. And that is not quite proper. Uh, High tea is actually a British supper, and it included meats and cheeses and other savories, as well as the sweets, and it was basically served to the workers that were coming home from the factories in the evening. So again, it was a little later meal for them and hearty. So high tea was meant to be taken at a, a high table, and afternoon tea was also called low tea. And this is because it was served at a lower table, very, very similar to what we have in our uh, parlor or living room, uh, a coffee table. So that was the low table. And um, it, it was always in the room Victorian style with the couches and overstuffed chairs. Now, there are hundreds of different teas, but they all come from one plant, and that's the Camellia sinensis. And legend credits... Uh, Chinese Emperor Shenyong for the discovery of tea in 2737 BC. Water was being boiled for him when a few leaves from a nearby bush floated into his huge cauldron and the aroma really caught his attention. And so he drank the broth and that is what we now know as tea, per the legend. So the many flavors of the tea come from the way it's processed. Again, it's the Camellia sinensis plant.
but it can be grown at a higher elevation or a lower. It could be uh, where the soil has more minerals than not. Uh, the climate, uh, I was just speaking to someone yesterday in where he is from, the, that high, high mountain area, there's something, he was talking about the fog coming in and all of that, again, would probably present a little more moisture to the plant. So a lot of it uh, depends on the level that it's grown at. And of course, it's grown in China. We always hear about all the tea in China, but it's more than that. India, Japan, Africa has tea now. Uh, you've probably heard of rooibos, which means red bush, and that is from Africa. And it is really not a tea in the Camilla sinensis family, but it has very, very good health properties to it. So there are the black, the green, the white, and the teas have many personalities, just like we do. Some are more robust, and some are rather mellow. And Darjeeling was a tea that I had early on, and that is called the champagne of tea. And that has a little more delicate flavor. From there, you could go up to a Ceylon, and that's just a little bolder step. And then Assam is the tea that you really graduate up to if you want a nice full cup of tea. Now that would be like a good strong Irish tea to get you going in the morning. Now can I just see how many, with a show of hands, how many here drink tea? Oh good, okay. Probably why you're here. Um, all right, now how many have loose leaf tea? Wow. This is impressive. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to make sure that people went away not being afraid of loose leaf tea or thinking that it was a pain to have to make or anything. So it's, it is very simple. You can use the tea ball, or I like to use the infuser. And this is perfect because it fits on top of a cup or a teapot. I have a couple styles that I like to use, and if I'm doing the teapot, I go with this with a little bit of a longer neck, but this one is fine too. And um, I like it because it's collapsible, and these are like stainless steel, so th the mesh is very, very fine on, on these, and the leaves, you know, none of the particles get in there. Yes, I have them in my shop. So, uh, and, and they last forever. They may get discolored. Some of mine are really a little funny looking, but they do the trick. They're, they're wonderful. And you can use a tea ball, but I just find that this is a whole lot easier and, and you know, convenient. So when you're making the tea, you only need to have one teaspoon of the tea. Okay, so you can fill that put it on your cup, pour your water, and let it brew. Probably three minutes, depending on what you're having. And because it's the whole leaf, it's very fine to use it again. You can infuse two times and still get the nice flavor out of that. So serving the real tea is actually very economical. So again, your brew time, three to five minutes maybe, depending on what you're having. And the whole trick is don't overbrew. If you'd like your tea to be a little bit stronger, you could add maybe another half a teaspoon, and then that will give it the oomph that you may be looking for. But if you let that sit longer, it's going to become very bitter, and it kind of ruins the nice flavor that you can have with the tea. Makes it very bitter. So when you're uh, preparing your water, uh, you start with cold water, something about the oxygen in there is better, and uh, you bring it to a rolling boil, and then you pour it over your leaves, and this particular thing used to be called agony of the leaves. And there was a, an English gentleman who I've seen at the tea expos and all, and he couldn't stand that, that the agony of the leaves. He's really, he loves tea. And 
he decided he was renaming it. So now when he pours the water and he watches, he calls it the dance of the leaves. He's so much happier with that. <laughs> so when you're having your, your tea, your Camellia sinensis, uh, is, well, any one of them, but particularly the black, I like to add whole milk and uh, a sugar. And many people say one lump or two. I think one lump is quite enough because you still want to taste your tea, of course. And you can decaffeinate the tea by throwing out your first cup and pouring again over the leaves the second time, and, and it's still very good. Now, herb teas are caffeine-free, and they can be used as a single herb, such as peppermint, or you can combine it with some other herbs and make your own creation. And tonight, what I had for you for the herbal was Angel Falls Mist, and this is an herb and fruit. So it's exotic strawberry with a lemon character, and uh, it has dried apple, hibiscus petals, the dried orange. It has quite a combination, and you can really, if you've tried this, I get the lemon right away when I'm having this, and, and that bit of sweetness. It doesn't really need anything. On my herbal teas, I like to put in a, a bit of honey, but this particular one, and some of the others that I have, it just can stand alone. It's very, very good. Uh, and when you are brewing your tea, once your pot is ready, you should put on a tea cozy. Now, there are a couple of different styles. This is what you call the dome, and this will fit over your pot nicely. And a friend in New Hampshire actually makes these, and... Uh, I love having these in my wallets in particular because they are made in New Hampshire. And she does things with special batting, so your pot stays very, very warm. And this is the other type where you put your pot in and you have a little place for your handle and you have a little place for your spout and pull it together and that stays nice and warm as well. There was a, a little story that I'd heard about this Irish couple, they were having dinner one night, and as usual, they would have their tea, and the gentleman reached across to get something else on the other side of the table. And when he did, his hat fell right on top of the teapot. So he took it off, and she said, oh, what makes that be quite cozy? And so we have the tea cozy, so they say. Uh, there's been questions about milk first or tea first. And originally, the tea cups were very, very thin, and uh, it, the fear was that they would crack, that they would break if you poured the hot into it. So it, it usually was the milk first, and maybe on the back of the spoon, pouring it in. And, but now, of course, the china that we use today is much stronger, and anything goes, really. Uh, so it's acceptable either way, milk first or with the hot water first. It doesn't matter. It's just your personal preference. Now, I have a wonderful book by Emily Barnes, and I will speak about a few books and authors tonight because it's the library. But this one in particular has been a favorite. If teacups could talk, the stories that they would tell. And this particular author, Emily Barnes, her mom had a shop downstairs for sewing. She was a seamstress. And then she had her flat up above. And she would always have her little table set. She always had her two cups out and her teapot and ready to go. And many times, people would come into the shop with a woe. And she very graciously would close the shop, go upstairs with the individual, make the pot of tea, and just let her talk and feel much better after she had her tea. So she was very kind. And so Emily, the daughter, has kind of taken everything on in her own way with hospitality. And um, she um, talks about the teacups that her mom received and then the teacups that she's received 
either from her grandmother or great aunt Catherine or a very, very special friend. So I'd like to know, does anybody here have a tea cup and saucer that is over 100 years old? You do, oh, okay. Would you mind sharing with us? Well, it was my mother's. Your mother's. You don't? I'm sure it is, but bring it out once in a while. Maybe on her birthday. That'd be a good time to at least use it. And yours too. Celebrate each other. And yours? Mine um, is, it's pretty small, in, as you said, very thin. Uh, it was given to my mom when I was a little girl mm. by an elderly lady who had just run away. Oh. And Mm. That's amazing. And that they survive, you know, so they are, they're treasures. They are really treasures, but they, they should be used as much as possible. How about anybody with just a, doesn't have to be 100 years old, but even a teapot that they've received or passed through the generations? No teapots? Yes? Teapots seem to acquire me rather than I acquire <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Very special, indeed. Yes? Passed on. That's great. And, and we should do that. And if you have a, a, a bridal, a young bride, and you go to a bridal shower, it's, it's always a lovely gift to receive, especially if there's some sentimental uh, value or story that goes with it. And then she will pass that on to her children as well. Well, that's good. You have kept that in the family. <laughs> um, and when you're talking about the kids, it's very, very nice to share the tea with the children. I have, um, uh, well, a couple of different things. The, the kids, they love to go through the whole ceremony of the tea. They like the experience of pouring the milk and adding the sugar cube or cubes or more cubes. Sometimes they come away with sugar water, and it's really not tea at all, but they're having a blast of doing it. So uh, when you have a tea party, it doesn't have to be just for young ladies. You can certainly do the tea party with the, the young gents, too. And I always say, have them bring their teddy bears, and the young girls can bring their dollies, and then they just have a grand time. And this is quality time that you will be spending with them. They love singing, I'm a little teapot. And I think we probably all know that. If we want to do a rendition, I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle, here is my spout. Am I the only one that knows this song? <laughs> when I get all steamed up and I shout, tip me over and pour me out. So they love 
hearing the story over and over and over again. No problem. And um, one of the other things, the story they like, is the story of Peter Rabbit. Did you have a question? Yes. Well, the British always want to say a certain time of day to do like 4 o'clock afternoon. I am going to tell you about that. Okay. Yes, I will. There's a couple of times I found out recently of another. Uh, so, Peter Rabbit. He was a naughty little bunny. He went into Mr. McGregor's garden and, of course, overindulged. And he had to go home, and his mom made him a lovely cup of chamomile tea. He had just such a terrible, terrible tummy ache from really just being plain naughty. So I always like to bring this cup. And, and when you have the kids, some little special thing, even if they come to your house and it's their little cup with a bear on it or a doll or a flower that they like, you know, that's theirs and they'll look forward to it. So <clears throat> when I have them over, I will have little treats for them as well. You can take the vanilla wafers and you can spread a little bit of cream cheese and chocolate chips on that. And they think they are just the cat's meow when they have all these little treats out there. And I also do it with uh, the maraschino cherries. I mix that, especially at Christmas time. It's always fun to have that uh, with the red. And you put it out on their little plate and they eat everything. <laughs> They really do have fun with it. And one of the things we hear about a lot is the health benefits of tea. And I will say green teas had the most press, but because it's all from the same plant, the Camellia sinensis, you have the same properties. So if it's black, green, or white, it's all good for you. And one of the things... Uh, w when they've done numerous studies, uh, it has shown that tea promotes healthy arteries. I'm not a doctor, so I haven't seen it myself. But uh, there's, there's a lot of evidence that tea is good, a lot of studies on it now. And the other thing, they say that it even fights cavities because it has a natural occurring fluoride in it. So I had an opportunity uh, to take a seminar with uh, called Drink Yourself Well, and this was uh, about a diet was rich in tea, and I studied under Dr. Fung Lung Chung, and that was his real name, and he's still around, and he's done extensive work on cancer, and he recently was published, so it was very exciting for me to read that, that I knew him oh, many years ago when he was starting this, but he has done a, a specific study on green tea and um, cancer prevention. So it's, it's nice to see that there are other alternatives. Yes? Are you able to tell us the difference between white tea and black tea? Okay. Uh, it's really the way that they're processed, and they can be fired, fermented, rolled. I'm talking about the leaves. And uh, the white tea in particular, the reason it's a little more expensive, it's the first two buds that come out. And so, and that's hand-picked, and so it's a little more labor-intensive. And the flavor is just heavenly. It, it's just so fresh. And then the other teas, you're shaking your head, yes, you've experienced the white tea. It's, it's really lovely. And uh, the green teas, Again, they're, they're just processed a little bit differently. And the properties are maybe a little bit different because of the processing, but you still have the main, um, again, back to that plant. And the black teas, uh, it's just the way they're processed, but they're all very good for you. But I will say some of them have uh, a first flush, like you can have a Darjeeling, a first flush Darjeeling. And so then they, those would be the early leaves that they would pick, and that would be more sought after. And then they also have a second flush of Darjeeling or others as well. But 
if you get that first flush, it, it's just something, the newness of it, the, the freshness uh, of it just coming out. And so that, that's the main difference between first and second flush, too. Yeah. Not quite, but <laughs> but there's it is about the processing, but that's not not quite. I mean, there's a little more to it than that. That's part of it. So <laughs> I can explain that maybe more in a little detail after. But um, so when we take our tea time, it really does create serenity for us, and I like to take the 15 minutes every day and nothing else, no phone calls, no list, nothing. Just take that time to sit and be very, very quiet and just enjoy the cup of tea and the brewing of the tea. The whole thing it helps you just to slow down and it, it carves out a very peaceful setting for you. And if you can train yourself just to stop and do that, I feel it's very, very beneficial. Because it's almost like you regroup with yourself, and then you're ready to take on the rest of the day. So we were talking about the tea times. I do that every day at 3. Yeah, not that I, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, I, I have it more than just at 3, but 3 is that carved out time for me. And it's just, again, just that 15 minutes. And it's a time if you want to, you know, have one day when you're inviting a couple neighbors in and just to share that time with them and sip away your cares. Uh, when I was in Ireland last year, I didn't know what was going on. I was at a college, and I happened to be in the kitchen at that time, and there was like an invasion. I'm like, what the heck is going on? It was 11. So I discovered that they also have tea. They call it 11s. So twice a day, 11s and at 3. But everything just stopped. You know, these were all the teachers that they came in. I don't know what happened to the kids, but <laughs> they were left behind when they came in. And uh, it, it was really kind of nice that they're, they're getting that little break also and getting uh, refreshed again. So it will provide tranquility. And it's just great to take that little time out for you every day, something special to look forward to. So you've probably heard the play on the T words. I've done the serenity, the tranquility, a lot of T words. If you practice spontaneity, it will increase your vitality. So make sure you do that too. Now, how many of you have been to a tea room, either here or abroad? We'll start with the US first. Can you uh, tell us where? Oh, yes, definitely. Yes, and that's probably one of the only places that we have to go to tea right now in, in our greater Manchester area anyway, uh, because we had antiquities. How many had been to antiquities? Yeah, she did a very, very nice job. Um, and what about other tea rooms? Yes. Benny's Tea Room. Oh, huh. I haven't heard of that one before. Very good. I learn as much as you do. Believe me, every time I come, it's uh, always something new for me, too, and fun. And I saw a couple other hands. Yes? And a lovely memory. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and um, I saw a couple other hands. Yes. Uh, Budapest in Hungary. In Budapest. Oh, and what type of tea did you have there? I don't remember. It was a black, yeah. a black oh. tea. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What brought you to Budapest? I mean, that's interesting that you would be able to travel that far. 
Oh, very fortunate <laughs> to have that. Yes? And my cousin, she comes to a tutoring in Ohio. Hmm. Someone was having to work with her. And it was rather neat because when he said, well, you were given a place setting in China, your, t your setting was different than the person next to you, than the person across from you. Right. And whoever had put the peacock together had collected peacocks from all around the world. Mm. So it was really fascinating. Mm. I've also been abroad in Stockholm, in Winter, and had two year peacock houses. Yes. Which is very different than the peacock. Yes, it is. And it's their normal thing to do. Yeah, they enjoy it. I thought I saw one more. Yes? Um, we used to have a two year month here in Concord. Oh. Delightful. Um, we now have the two spoon barista who does different kinds of tea here in Concord. Oh. But, um, and mm. others have. I've been abroad and had tea in Ireland and Scotland and Wales and England and mm. more in more in the north than in the south because that's where our friends live. And um, also along the Rhine, Main Danube, and all the way down. To, uh, tea in Turkey. Oh. Well, that must have been great. I mean, I haven't heard anyone have that many experiences. That is really wonderful. Good and exchange students. Oh. And then you visit. Ah, <laughs> good way to do it. See the world, huh? Great. Well, thank you all for sharing. And uh, the these are all memories, wonderful, special things that tea can do for you and friends and family. Um, one of the things, let me see if I have it here, um, that used to be was the tea apron. And tea aprons first became popular in the late 18, 1800s, and the household staff would wear the type with the whole bib coming down to the front. And they called that the long utilitarian bib. And th those were a very sturdy fabric because they were working and it needed to be. And the mistress of the house underscored her special status by presiding at the tea table in a short dainty apron, very decorative. This was just a, a little Battenberg lace type of thing, but they would have um, taffeta or silk even, and it was like, wow. So it lets you know who was head of that house. And they all often came trimmed with little ruffles or embroidery, and uh, they were really pretty fancy dancy. So you knew who's house you were at. And the tea room, also I love it. It was an era for the female entrepreneur. In the period of 1884, right up until the 1940s, um, women, this was a new thing, to go out and have a tea room. I'm so glad there's, there has been a resurgence in, in campuses, uh, a lot more. Sometimes you even hear about bubble tea that they have at the colleges and universities and some tea rooms. If you go into Boston, you can certainly get that. Uh, I don't know if anybody else around here is serving it, but um, I read a book, uh, it's the Blue Lantern Tea Room, and she did a study of all the different tea rooms all over New England, and it was fascinating. And they were used, remember, in those earlier years, uh, I think like a stagecoach you know, stop, you know, but places that it was necessary to have something to stop at. And uh, the tea room became very, very popular. And for men too, I mean, they'd serve a hearty meal. It was, wasn't just the, the tea and the dainties. But it was the first time in history, really, that women had the opportunity to work in an accepted profession. And uh, they were able to generate income for themselves. So it drew women out of the home and into society and the workplace, and it was one of the few places that she could go unescorted. So it really was a big deal as they were coming of age. And when I was growing up, um, our Saturday paper had a society page, and there was always an article 
every week about a tea that was given, and the big deal was who poured. So whoever poured was a very special guest at that gathering. So she was the guest of honor, and she would be at one end of the dining table, and the hostess would be at the other end. And that was the time when the silver service was usually put out, and it was really uh, a very important part of society back in that day, and it was truly an honor, truly an honor. So part of the silver service, uh, when I was doing some research, I found out there were two pieces that were a little unusual. One was called the slop bowl. I hate the name of it. However, it was very, very beneficial. And the other was the moat spoon, and both of them were important. The moat spoon, if there were a few little leaves that escaped into your cup, you could just kind of skim it off with that. But the slop bowl was used to pour your last little bit of tea that had become cold. And so your hostess could then fill it again with a nice hot brew. So they would just pass it around and pour their old tea into it. So they could have had a little catchier name, I think, but it worked in the day. So now cooking with tea. Cooking with tea is starting to become very popular in uh, homes as well as restaurants. And I can prepare um, a jasmine tea, and I use the jasmine tea in the water for my rice instead of just the plain water, and it gives it a beautiful, beautiful taste and um, kind of a unique flavor. And then there's another tea called Lapsong Souchong, and this is a tea that has a very smoky, bold uh, taste and, and scent. It's very strong. It's not one of my favorites, but if I've had it where uh, they've prepared duckling and brushed the tea on it throughout, and it makes a beautiful mahogany color. So when it's served to you, it's very, very pretty. And the grocery stores now have teas, you've probably seen them, that are rubbed. A lot of tea rubs are on the meat now, and I see chocolate that has little bits of tea in it. So it, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. So you just have to kind of look and see. And so there's uh, even now martinis. <laughs> and I was like, wow, what next? <laughs> so they can make a martini and that would be without having the liquor in it and just having a really uh, higher level tea. And of course now with the martinis and all martinis, regular, there's all this fruit that's been put into them. And uh, you have to watch it because they can sneak up on you. But with these martinis, you don't have to worry. And they're getting to be very popular. I wanted you to know that uh, tea also is something that's served at the White House. Uh, the protocol, I mean, it, there are dignitaries coming in from all over the world. And we are a coffee-drinking nation, more so than tea. We're getting there. So, but when other people come, tea is their drink. And so for us to uh, have tea for them, that again is a sign of showing some hospitality for them. And uh, I've seen, uh, just watching news at night, the table set with a teapot. They have a couple dignitaries with them, and that's what they were doing. They were having their tea while they were talking rather than um, something else, you could tell, because the pot was right there. And one of the presidents actually used a tea theme on a Christmas card one year. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I like finding all these little facts about the tea. And um, I wanted just to tell you about a few of the books that I have collected over the years, and because we're at a library, and some of the people that are known tea people. Jane Pettigrew, she's a, a big name in tea. And this is her Tea Time collection of traditional recipes. And it's a very nice book with the, the pictures and all, too. So she's 
sort of one of the grandmas of tea. She's been around for a long time and really knows how to combine things for a very lovely tea party. Now, James Norwood Pratt is another gentleman, the tea lover's treasury. And he also has been around for a long time. And there's probably other books by, by both of them, but those are two good tea names if you're looking uh, for someone. You were talking about the, the tea party for the children. And this is a tea party book, and it has all different themes, whether it's Valentine's or Christmas or uh, a full moon tea party. They do all types of things. So a lot of books, uh, adult and children, will do that, have the theme. So you really don't have to do a lot of research. They just have everything kind of figured out for you. And here's an example of the, the little girl with the big teddy bear. So that was another. And there is a magazine, T, a magazine. And this, I believe you can get it at Barnes & Noble. Uh, and I get this all the time. And there's always something new. Look, throw a foolproof cocktail party. There we are with the martinis. And <clears throat> another series that has come out uh, is by Laura Childs. And she does a mystery kind of a thing. And she, uh, her first book was Death by Darjeeling. And she's uh, had a few others published. But it's, they're kind of fun. Uh, Gunpowder Green, Keepsake Crimes. I mean, she does it all in different types of teas. But you can get into it a little bit. It's kind of different but enjoyable. And I wanted to say, which you probably have known now by a couple of the comments, that uh, the Celtic countries, Ireland in particular, you are very, uh, you, you can never leave somebody's house. You just are not allowed to leave until you have sat down and had a proper cuppa. And it would be insulting if you should say, oh, no, no, thank you. Don't do it. You can't do it. They don't let you anyway. Come on, come on. You just have, have a minute. So uh, they also, they claim to be the most discriminating tea drinkers in the world, the largest consumers. There's an average of four to six cups a day, man, woman, and child. So they've, they've just grown up with it. And um, so that's about all I want to share with you tonight. There's one other item by my friend, uh, it's called a tea wallet. And this is kind of a clever thing. She's made it into a trifold, and you can put your teas in here. It's a little classier to have this in that little baggie in your purse. So I like that, again, because it is New Hampshire made. And <clears throat> one of the other things that we have, and with uh, a lot of people getting to have some company now with the holidays coming, we have our own Boston Tea Party that you can go into it in Boston. And they do a reenactment of the whole thing. You get to actually throw the chest over. And it's very uh, Disney-ish. You, you go into three different rooms. They're costumed. And it's a lot of fun. And in the end, you, you end up at Abigail's Tea Room. And they serve you a nice cup of tea. So it's different. Uh, instead of a museum, it's a museum in its own way. Uh, and I have the Boston Tea Party Tea, and this is an Earl Grey. And I love that this company was able to make this, and they just show the ship. So you get to go on it, and that would be fun. I have um, some of these up here if you're, you're interested. And the other uh, place where tea is grown is in South Carolina. We have our own Charleston tea plantation. I don't know where I put it, but um, who has heard of Constant Comet tea? That was uh, Mrs. Ruth Bigelow, who made that tea in her own kitchen. And it was getting constant comments from all of her friends. So she decided, that's what I'm going to call it, Constant Comet. So today, it is actually the Bigelow family that has this tea room. So if, and they're very nice about, you know, taking you on a tour. So if you happen to be there, so I will leave these two here for 
your pleasure. And um, let's see. I guess that's about it. I hope that you've enjoyed hearing some of these tea bits instead of tidbits. And thank you for inviting me.